Heavenly Father, we thank you uh, for giving us the Bible that teaches us about who you are and what you would have of us. We ask that this morning, as we look at it, that you would help us to see uh, the wonder of Jesus more and also have clarity in our mind of the message and of the purpose that you've given us as well. In Jesus' name we ask and pray. Amen. Uh, So really, this story begins with one man. Uh, One man lands on a beach of an island and he's tasked with what's an impossible mission. He's there to bring order out of chaos. He's there to help this struggling group of Christ followers. He's there to bring the gospel, the good news about Jesus, to a people who don't want it. And the people on this island, uh, they're very contrary to the message of Jesus. They define the good life in ways that God doesn't. So you can imagine that newspapers wouldn't be able to be trusted. Politicians are corrupt. It's harsh. It's a selfish and it's a greedy culture. A culture where people are reluctant to do manual work. A culture in which people routinely overeat. A culture where people look out for themselves first. And this culture may sound familiar because it could be describing 21st century culture that we're a part of. But this is describing as well first century Crete. One of Crete's own respected men, a philosopher, Epimenides, uh, he says about the Cretans, he says, Cretans are always liars, evil brutes, lazy gluttons. And Paul, having met them, says in verse 13 that he actually agrees with Epimenides. And these guys are known as greedy pirates on this island. One guy, uh, Plutarch, he was about 20 when Titus was written. And he tells us that there's this legend of being no wild beasts on the island of Crete. Uh, But they didn't need wild beasts because the Cretans, they were the wild beasts. And that was the type of island and the reputation they had. And Suetonius, he was born just after Titus was written. And while he was alive, he writes how there's this special verb that they were using in Rome at the still at the time. It was Cretan. And so if you said, I had to be a bit Cretan today, you're saying that you had to lie. And that was the reputation of this island of people that Titus has been placed on this beach. And he's unsure. You know, how does he help a culture like this? A society that doesn't want help. A culture that doesn't want Jesus. And so Paul writes this letter, a letter to his, to his companion. He, he, he has like a father-son relationship. He cares for this guy. And, and he tells him how to reach these people with the good news of Jesus. He tells him how to be a Christian in this climate. It's a public letter, meaning that even though Paul writes it to Titus, he expects the whole church to be listening uh, to this letter to Titus. And it's here to help Titus, and it's here to help us to know how to reach a culture against Christ. Because this letter isn't just for Titus in Crete. This letter is for us at Bannockburn. So that God tells us via Paul how to reach Bannockburn and beyond with the gospel. The news about Jesus that every single person would want to hear about. And how do we bear this great news? How do we tell of this great news? Well, in the first few verses, Paul greets Titus. He summarizes what's coming and he gives three simple priorities, three priorities that are crucial for telling of this news of Jesus, understanding the work of Jesus. The gospel work that each of us here at BPC to be all about. Here's the three simple priorities. But first you have to ask, why listen to Paul? Why listen to this guy and how to reach people with the good news of Jesus? Well, he's got major authority that he wields humbly. If you look at verse 1 there, at the start it says, Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ. So this guy, he sees himself... As a slave of God. He's humble so that he's not living for himself. 
unlike the false teachers he talks about in verse 11, he's living for God. And he also says that he's an apostle. Now, Paul has seen Jesus. He's seen Jesus when he's come back from the dead. And this gives him the authority to teach from Jesus himself. And he gives his first priority as an example for Titus to follow and also for us to follow. Look at his first priority. It is look for faith. It's, he says it. He does all the for, he says, a servant of God and apostle of Jesus for the sake of the faith of God's elect. And so he's telling Titus, Titus, I do this for the faith of God's chosen people. And you are too as well. And we see this in Paul's ministry in the other passage that we read in Acts 18. He's where Paul's in Corinth. The Jews have rejected him. Uh, Gentiles are being saved. And God says to him, don't be afraid, but go on speaking and don't be silent. For I am with you and no one will attack you to harm you. For I have many in this city who are my people. There are people on this island who are God's elect. Tell the gospel for their sake, Paul's saying, for them to come to faith. And that faith would continue on. And some people think this idea of the elect or this idea that God chooses people for himself, the idea of sovereignty of God, acts as a disincentive to tell people of Jesus. You know, why should we preach the gospel and tell people of Jesus if people's responses are ultimately in God's hands? But for Paul, it has the opposite effect. He knows there are people out there who God has chosen to make alive, the elect. All they need is for someone to tell them the good news of Jesus. And he could be that person to tell them. Paul's life was lived looking for the faith of God's elect. God has done the choosing. God will do the ultimate persuading. All Paul has to do is find the elect. It's a bit like gardening in some ways. My, my little daughter, Grace, wants to, wants to plant a veggie garden. And uh, she's been talking about planting a veggie garden for quite a while. And you know those little packets of seeds you get with all the seeds in them? They've got used-by dates on the packets of seeds. And if you get one of those packets past their used-by dates... You never know when you plant them which seeds are actually going to grow and which seeds are just going to do nothing because they're past their use by date. And you plant them and you water them and you do everything you can. But in the end, you don't know which seeds will grow and which seeds won't. Some will. And sometimes, you know, we may look around at neighbors or in the workplace or with clients or with family members and in some ways... You're never sure where they're at. But you water those seeds by preaching the gospel, by living the gospel, by loving because of the gospel. And then God will use that to bring his elect to new life. Because we don't know who God's elect are. But we can tell about the good news of Jesus like Paul does. We look for faith. And in the busyness of church life, in the busyness of just general life, it can be hard to prioritize talking and asking questions and discussing faith. But this is what Paul worked for, what Titus is to work for, and what we're to work for. Titus wasn't necessary to use his time on this island of Crete to fix everyone's problems and try to change the culture by just being a good guy. He was there on that island to tell them about faith in Jesus. And that's what he was there for. He didn't spend his time fixing everyone's problems. He spent his time as first priority, just like Paul's first priority, and just like it should be our first priority, to look for faith of God's elect. Paul's first priority for a culture against Christ, to know Christ, is look for faith. His second priority is love knowledge. And we love knowledge... He tells us, because knowledge of Christ leads to godliness. Look at the end of verse 1 there. For the sake of the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth, which leads to, which accords with godliness. 
Now, Paul isn't content for people to simply come to faith. He labors to ensure that their faith grows too. They grow in their knowledge of Christ, of the truth, and so godliness comes. Godliness authenticates the truth. Godliness is the sign of truth because this truth of Jesus Christ leads to godliness. Now, what does Paul mean by, by godliness? Because often when we think of godliness, we just think of this outward behavior. It's like, you know, in, in, in your home, you can have a home that's tidy, uh, but just because a home's tidy, it doesn't necessarily mean it's clean, does it? You know, I can tidy up my office, but in no way does that immediately make it clean. I need to do a lot of more work on my office if I want it to be clean. And, and people can have tidy lives. They can look good on the outside. But godliness isn't about just looking good on the outside. This knowledge that leads to godliness is, is a truth that cleans us in the inside. And when a place is clean, generally it looks tidy. But it's about being clean in the first place. And this is the godliness that Paul's talking about. So the more we understand what God has done for us in Christ, the more we love that glorious knowledge, the more we will love him and so live for him. Christianity is by no means simply believing the right things. Belief is nothing if we do nothing because of it. But Paul's goal was not just Faith. His goal was converts who become disciples. His, goals, his goal was that these disciples embrace the knowledge of truth. So there's not just about a change of behavior. Christianity is not just about a change of behavior. It's not enough to just look good in front of others. That's not what Christianity is about. Christianity is about the knowledge of Jesus. And this creates real godliness. A godliness that just isn't on the outside, but one that comes from within. Because he changes our hearts, our core, our inner being. And so fill your life like Paul would with the knowledge of Jesus. And by filling our lives with the knowledge of Jesus and getting it into us, you know, focusing on the truth of God's word and telling it to ourselves every day and pouring it over in our homes with our kids and we, and we think about it and however we can do it, we get it into us. You know, I don't enjoy the taste of coffee, but you know, some people are massive coffee lovers. They just need a coffee in the morning to make sure they don't speak at people with annoyance in their tone. They just need a coffee. One, one coffee lover I read about, he couldn't find his coffee filter, so he used his sock instead because he's just so desperate to get some coffee into him. And that, that desire... Of, 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 of for someone to have some coffee. That's, that's the desire we should have for this knowledge that leads to godliness. We want to know more about Jesus Christ. The one, we want to know more about his love and the height and depth and width and length so that we can experience the fullness of God in our lives. And that leads us to living a life pleasing to God. We can't do it ourselves. We desperately need the knowledge of truth. And how often, how often people have tried to change their own lives with their own efforts and their own strength. And I know I've done it many times where I've decided I'm going to do better, but I consistently keep slipping up and failing. We need more than just ourselves to live a life loving to others and loving to God. We need this knowledge of Jesus Christ that changes us and shapes us. Soon we're going to enjoy the Lord's Supper together. And this is part of it. This is part of what strengthens us in the knowledge of Christ. As we are reminded of the sacrifice of Christ on the cross for us. Where his body was broken and his blood was shed for us. That's part of the knowledge that leads to godliness. That's how we change. And that's how we change a culture like today. That's how Titus changes the culture on Crete. That's how we change a culture in Babylon with this knowledge of Jesus Christ. 
And that's how our community will change. That's how our families will change. That's how we will change. An addiction for this knowledge of Jesus Christ, for the knowledge found in it of the truth of Christ that will change us and change our heads and our hearts and our hands. So first, look for faith. Second, love knowledge. And third, long for eternity. Look at verse 2. This is what he says. In hope of eternal life, which God who never lies, as opposed to the Cretans who are known as liars, promised before the ages begin. And the gospel work here, the, the news of Jesus here in Bannockburn or Lethbridge or Inverlee or Teesdale or Jeringap or whatever other regions around, it's all in the hope of eternal life. It's all set in the context of forever. And that's an incredible thought to think that what we do today has eternal implications. Because us, us telling of Jesus bears fruit that will last into eternity. I recently heard of one of the most significant events in the entire universe. It happened in 2013 when uh, space-based telescopes picked up a cosmic explosion, the biggest explosion ever witnessed by human beings. And it lit up stars all over those. If it was within a thousand light years of Earth, life would have been obliterated on our planet. That's how massive this event was, this cosmic explosion, the biggest event ever witnessed by human beings. Except that it's not really the biggest because if you compare that one explosion in a moment of time to all of eternity, and when someone comes to know Jesus Christ and to follow him and trust in him and repent of their sins, that that was planned from eternity past and will have ramifications for eternity future. That is the biggest event that could ever happen because that is all of eternity. That impacts all of eternity. A massive cosmic explosion doesn't compare with that event in history of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ that affected all of eternity, all of time. And this church stands for and lasts into eternity. People here who have the knowledge of Jesus and follow him have the hope of eternity. And this eternal promise of God appears when we tell people of Jesus. Eternal life appears in your region, in your town, in your home. When you speak of Jesus, as you speak the gospel, eternity enters history because Christ is made present. And if you think of eternity, just a never ending that goes on and on and on. Uh, you, you, you think of your own life compared to that. In the last 20 years, it's just a small, small, tiny moment. And the next 20 years is just a blip in comparison. But even then, what a moment that blip is when eternal stories are told. And when eternal fates are sealed. It is a moment when Christ will be shown through our words. And that's how Paul understood in verse 3. He says, And at the proper time, manifested, revealed in his word, through the preaching, which with I have been entrusted by the command of God our Savior. God gives Paul, God gives Titus, God gives us a command to tell others. And as we do that, eternity enters history. And this means eternal realities should shape everyday life. Because, the, I don't know about you, but I, I feel like I live a pretty ordinary life. Really, all of us live fairly ordinary lives. If you think of the last 24 hours, you know, maybe you went shopping. I went shopping twice because I forgot something and the shops are so close. You know, I, I just had a meal. I ate three meals and a few snacks in between and I went to sleep. And it's very ordinary lives we live in many ways, isn't it? And yet these ordinary lives are shaped by an eternity. When we think 
of what Jesus gives us by dying for us on a cross. That he promises us an eternal hope in heaven. Session right now, the elders of this church, we're reading a book by Stephen McAlpine. It's called Being the Bad Guys. A great book for, um, for elders to read, Being the Bad Guys. It, how to live for Jesus in a world that says you shouldn't. And McAlpine, he tells of a man, his name was Ernest Shackleton. And Ernest Shackleton, he, he wanted to go on a polar expedition. But he needed this team to go with him. And so he puts it in this advertisement in a newspaper. And the advert reads like this when he's wanting recruits for his polar expedition. He says, men wanted for hazardous journey, low wages, bitter cold, long hours of complete darkness, safe return, doubtful. Honor and recognition in event of success. That was the advert. It didn't sound too promising. But he gets 5,000 applications for it. None of them probably asked about fringe benefits or if there'd be good sleeping quarters. They all knew the arduous journey ahead. And see, when Paul said to Titus, I'm leaving you on that island, I'm leaving you in Crete, he may have felt a little bit like this advertisement. Oh, why sign up? There's ridicule, there's a culture against you, you could be hated, you could lose your job, you could die. And yet, Titus willingly wants to do this. And he wants to do this because of this third principle, a longing for eternity. Paul knew, Titus knew, we can know the hope of eternal life. So that even though we may suffer now, unlike the men on that polar expedition who didn't know if they'd have a safe return, we do know there's a promise for us, a guaranteed heavenly home, so that no matter what we may suffer for the gospel, there's glory to come. And as a follower of Christ, you know, in our culture, it it, it may mean that we sign up to a hazardous journey if we decide to follow Christ. We may see times of bitterness directed at us because of our faith in our culture. We may see times where we lose our jobs for the Christian ethics that the Bible that God gives us in his word and the ethics that our culture resists. But that's all part of signing up. And the explosive news of eternity makes this all worth it. And so one, one thing, one word that Kaz has been, Kaz has been mentioning, the, the word inconvenience. Are you ready to be inconvenienced for eternity? Looking for the faith of God's elect and what, Titus, what Paul's priorities are here, it's often inconvenient because it requires time and it requires effort And it requires relationships as we go in our lives. You know, uh, when you go to work to have the thought on your mind that I'm going to look for the faith of God's elect, that requires effort and can be inconvenient because all you want to do is just focus on the work at hand and get it done. Or when you go to the footy or or to park run or wherever you're going, you know, it's easier just to get involved in the community and get absorbed with family than to be inconvenienced with having this thought on your mind, I need to look for the faith of God's elect. But that's what we're called to do. And we do it because of the hope of eternity. And so we look for faith and so we're inconvenienced. If we want to reach this culture for Christ, let's be ready to be inconvenienced. Hospitality is inconvenient at times. Engaging with our community is often inconvenient. Church can be inconvenient at times. But we don't live for convenient lives. We live for eternity. We have the joy of taking the Lord's Supper, like I mentioned before. And if it's there that we remember that one day we will eat with Christ in heaven together. That's part of what we do when we take the Lord's Supper that he commands us. Uh, that we're living for that day. A day where we will feast with Christ in heaven. And so here's a letter to a man who wants to win a culture for Christ. And it's a letter for each of us who wants the same for our culture. With these three simple prayers. Look for faith. Love knowledge. Long for eternity. 
And that's how we begin. That's how we continue. And the rest of this letter that we're going to go through over the next few weeks, it's fascinating in the cultural context and the historical context, but also it's for us today and how it pans out in the church in Crete and how it pans out for us right here in Bano. And so we'll pray soon. And then after we pray, we're going to take the Lord's Supper together because we're going to relish in the knowledge of Christ sacrificing himself on a cross for us. So this knowledge changes us to our core, cleans us up and leads to godliness. And we take it longing for eternity where we will one day enjoy a feast with the Lamb, with Jesus himself. And what a day that'll be. So let's pray together and then we'll have the Lord's Supper. Father, we thank you for the wonderful message that Jesus Christ offers us forgiveness for our sin and for our rebellion against you as our King. Thank you that, that we can have, uh, through repentance and faith, that we can have a hope of eternity. We know that through this knowledge of Jesus Christ and his great love, that it can shape and mold and change us. And we pray that you would continue to do that in each of our lives. In Jesus' name we ask and pray. Amen.